However, one of the key questions that are a bit touchy uh, to, to ask a government entity is, when do you expect to budget for this project? Now, if, you really, if you're close to the person, don't talk about selling, understand their needs, and what you want to key on is, do they have the budget? Now, you want to see the lights go on or off. Now, it is very sensitive, okay? So, but by asking them, and if they say yes, you have, the, you know, here's where you're going to spend time. Here's where you're going to spend your effort. Welcome to the riskadvisor.com podcast. I'm Sal LaFrieri, and I'm here with my good friend and co-host, Jim Henry. Before we begin, I'd like to remind each of you to subscribe to the show and to push the like button for us. Please leave your comments as your opinion is really important to us. So, Jim, we're doing this government contract thing. It turned out to be way more information than that we could cover in one show. We decided to do a couple of shows on it. Why don't you explain to the listening audience here what we're doing and how we're setting up the shows? Well, and normally you know, our, our podcasts, you know, a, a three part of the show. And the first, you know, generally describes a problem. The second piece of it is the or second segment is the logistics. And the third is a solution. Given the, the complexity of this subject matter here, what we're effectively doing is podcast one, you know, introduce, you know, the you know, the challenges and the problems of uh, navigating government contracts and, you know, the tail end of first podcast. And now this podcast is going to be centered on logistics. And then podcast three in this series uh, will really focus on the focus on the solutions. So with that, we'll rejoin with Stu, where we left off in podcast one. We were on the, the point of what we should be looking for when we see an RFP and what is next. So, so thank you. So, again, what this, what should I look for in, in an RFP and what is next? But as we started at the end of the last hour of the last part of the podcast, can and I want to get back to some key items, and that is, can I fulfill the contract requirements? That, of course, every supplier and, and every vendor understands they have to meet the contract. Okay, they cannot get away from that. They have to understand that if they don't ref- fulfill the requirements, they're is going to be issues that will follow, will that may even haunt them in the future. And do I have a partial solution? And we'll talk about that. That is a very deadly way to go into a project. <laughs> so then can I fulfill the contract and the intent of the contract? So do I, and I'm going to be very clear. Do I understand what I have to meet in the contract and what is called intent of the contract? Think of it as being what's between the lines. What is the RFP asking for? What is the white line saying? And what is it that I have to finally do? And what is it going to cost me to get to the goalpost and get there and, you know, and and get my touchdown? So this is a real power both on the vendor side and the agency side. Not only do disconnect occur, but I have seen vendors fall horribly because they thought they understood the RFP. And that they had no idea that there is, an, there is an intent part in the RFP which is not written in the RFP. It's vague. It's there. You really have to read it. However, your success or failure is whether or not you have met both the contract RFP as well as the intent of the RFP. And we'll get into that in the in, in later podcast. Okay, so let's get a little bit into uh, – excuse me, well, let me just finish off. Um, do I have – questions you need to ask is do I meet the minimum requirements? We'll get into that because at the beginning of every contract, that's the first thing it's going to say. Do What are the minimum you have to meet? Is the scope clear? I love that one because I can tell you the scope is a an art, not a written item that's done you know, by some legal person, even though a legal person, by the way, will read it and has basically asked every possible question to make sure that it is understood. Again, the intent is still out there. Hang on. Well, so let me just ask you, could jump in for a second, ask you a quick question. With the so someone who winds up getting the RFP, you know, when you say, you know, do they meet the requirements? So if someone's getting the RFP, they shouldn't assume then that they've met the requirements. Because I guess common common sense would indicate if you're getting the RFP, gee, you qualified, you guys would have done the agency issuing the RFP would have done some pre-qualification. Nope. That's not always the case. Not the key at all. What the agency does is they look at, they look up, I've done it myself, okay? They look up what are the companies within the niche that can do this job, 
okay, whether they can complete it or not, they don't know. Because so if you've got a good website, you're good to go. It is very important to have a good website, but we kind of gotten back, we have to get back to what we talked about earlier, which is what have you done when you've met with that agency? Did you educate them or did you sell your product? Well, if you sold your product and you're going to, and, and again, am I trying to fit my, and we'll talk about that, my cat's product into the, in, into the, you know, the round peg in the square hole, that ain't going to work. You will, at the end of it, even though you may have a very good writer, we'll talk about that as well, and can say, and, and the RFP response says that you're doing everything, okay, you may find yourself that you didn't, and you've got a round peg in a square hole, and you will beat yourself up something ugly to try to complete that. What I'm specifically saying is that at the beginning of the contract, there is a brief scope. It always says brief scope. There are usually three or four things that are in there going across almost every agency that's out there, state, city, you know, private agency or whatever. And that is one of the top, one of the top ones or bottom ones, depending on where they place it. Do you have X amount? How much money have you uh, sold in this year? How much have you done? In other words, are you a million dollar company? Are you, in other words, don't respond if you have not done a million dollars worth of sales. Easy one. Don't respond if you don't have this piece of technology. Don't respond if you don't have X amount of people. That's what I mean by the minimum requirements. After that, you as a company have to understand the rest of the scope and say, well, can I do that? And how do you respond? So that's the minimum requirements. So I'll make an editorial comment. (laughs) I knew you would. but That is relevant Mm -hmm. when you are responding to an RFP that is put out by the agency directly. But when the agency on a construction project is has a GC between the suppliers and the agency, the GC very often will subjectively overlook some of those minimum requirements. Mm-hmm. Not that this is right, but it's happened in order to chase a number that they want to get to. And that is, that's very, da- that's dangerous for all stakeholders. It's not good for the agency. It mm-hmm. is not good for the integrator. It's not good for the manufacturers because you don't understand the rules of engagement. You don't know then how to price it because you're chasing ambiguity. Right. So if you're, if you're one below the GC and you're trying to, you don't have that information and we've been through that in a different lifetime. Well, we, I've seen RFPs that yeah. have come out from the GC right. that show the minimum requirements, but I lived through the reality that, well, they're not really minimum because if, you're, if you really make a compelling argument financially, yeah, we'll dismiss them. <laughs> well, you see, again, you have to show in your RF, response to the RFP, which again, you better not fluff that, is your financials, okay? And the finance guy, who's in that agency has to go through that, okay? Because he is, he is audited as well. So if he comes up wrong and says that, let's say the, the, let's say the GC says that they've made no, $100 million worth of sales, okay, this year, and he hasn't, okay, and the financials show up otherwise, it's going into the garbage. You may have won it, but you will lose it. Oh, uh, well- I, I've seen some examples of where we had met all those requirements. Some competition did not, but they got the business because you know they made them an offer they couldn't refuse. <laughs> well, I, 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 I don't know which agency it is. I know that when I was the agency chief contract officer and I went to the finance guy and I said, does this meet the financial requirement? And basically I had a checklist and his name went on it. Okay, so whatever licenses he had, not just could he be fired, he would lose his license. So, yeah, I don't get again. That, that's what that's what I was scratching my head thinking too. But somehow that, and it was more so not so much about the financial metrics, mm-hmm. it was more so about the experience factor with the subject matter and what have you. Where, you know, it was certainly not up to the snuff of what was being called for. You know, in the so you know, so the that's RFP. the part which we'll talk about dealing with, and that becomes <clears throat> subjective. Okay, you try to, you know, I've written as I as I've written RFPs, and I try to be as 
objective as possible by having people doing compliances and features and, and, and that you had to meet these, okay, so that you can be evaluated. But let me just, we're getting, we're going to get into that a little bit more in depth. So do I meet the minimum requirement? Is the scope clear? Knowing your product and most of all the industry, what has the RFP left out and how do I handle what seems to be left out in parts? And by the way, Jim, you're good at that. You're good at check, catching those things and making sure that, you know, that's done correctly. The piece uh, of that- Just because I have a good memory and yes. I know what's hurt in the past. <laughs> exactly. And you need to know that. Experience. Yeah. Do I understand what is the RF, what, do I understand what is an RFI, which is a very funny scenario and whether you want to spend money on that. Right. An RFQ, an RFP, we won't discuss DBOM. Design, build, operate, maintain. We, I, I kind of touch on that because that's a, that's a whole construction. That's another nine that's a, podcast. Right? That, that, that's a different one. <laughs> and the other item which people miss so often, okay, is do I need a moderator at the meeting? And then last time is how are responses evaluated and how are standard response, uh, and how, are they, how are they evaluated? Who's there? What does it? How do, how do you know whether you've made it? All right. Yeah, that's a good break point. I'll take a quick break here and then we'll jump back into the logistics on that. You are listening to the Risk Advisor Podcast, hosted by myself, Jim Henry, and Sal LaFrary. We invite you to comment on our blog at theriskadvisor.com and subscribe and follow us on our social media like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you are interested in having one or both of us speak at an upcoming event or would like to consult with us, please go to our webpage at theriskadvisor.com to set that up. So, Stu? Yes. Pick that up. So we're going we're gonna to start kind of over from the beginning kind of perspective and by misunderstanding of initial meetings and go into like in more in depth of it. And then as you spoke about later at final, we'll get into some real heavy stuff. You'll have some, there may be some re- repetition because we kind of, in, in talking, we kind of cover some of those pieces. Right, okay. Right. But, but it's important, I think, to kind of do it in, in, in a manner so that we understand how one follows the other. So how would a company get in front of a government agency? How does a company get in front? A professional organization show, uh, will have a show in, in an excellent place to meet a government prospect. However, many people who go to a show are in learning mode. And you have to remember that. Okay, and not in purchasing mode. Purchasing mode is a whole different place. So, if you want to do the right thing when you're at a seminar, when you're at a at a meeting, you want to be at learning. The moment you start talking sales, and we'll talk about that, you can find yourself going down, you know, where they'll shut down. Right. It's the early stages of the RFI. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's the, it's the pre-RFI. I mean, if you think about it, what we're talking about when we're doing this whole podcast, it's, this is almost like a primer, if mm-hmm. you think about it. So since procuring is a service product, it's an entirely different methodology for an agency. So do not expect to close a deal at a show, a seminar, unless you already have a contract. We will try to get into the types of purchases in the future podcast. Teaching an agency new products or services is important, and you and your showcase will, in many cases, bring an idea, concepts to an agency which they may act upon, and from that create an RFP. Understand that project managers and P and departments have a certain amount of wiggle room, and if I have time to talk about that, I can talk about something that's called the six percent. Okay, and we'll we'll talk about that a little bit later. However, one of the key questions that are a bit touchy uh, to, to ask a government entity is, when do you expect to budget for this project? Now, if you really, if you're close to the person, don't talk about selling, understand their needs, and what you want to key on is, do they have the budget? Now, you want to see the lights go on or off. Now, it is very sensitive, okay? So, but by asking them, and if they say yes, you have, the, you know, here's where you're going to spend time. Here's where you're going to spend your effort. Okay, because they're either going to start a scope in, in a project that I did literally three years before I actually did the project, I was asking for the money. Okay, and that's one of the reasons why, as I spoke to you when we were doing an, a sidebar, I was more successful in writing RFPs because people would start writing RFPs and then they'd go to the budget people and say, you know, I need the money. And they says, why did you think you were going to do this? You don't have any money. Director has no idea that this is going on. Who's backing you on it? So the word budget is very important. If they don't have a budget, education is important because you don't know when they're going to get it, okay, or if they're going to ask for it. Can they use monies through a contract that they have to be able to do that? We'll, we'll talk about that. So quick, 
quick comment question at that point. So when when you're out there in this early stage RFI, mm-hmm. you know, at the trade shows, you know you have a you know an issue that you're trying to deal with. You're out there looking at technologies that could be a fit for this. And of course, you know, you get out there to a, you know, trade shows are typically you got these people standing out there, you know, and, and, and on the manufacturer side, you know, that are talking about, you know, not only exists what's today, but you know, what's the roadmap, what's coming and and that fine line between reality and tomorrowland, you know, becomes very vague. To a degree, if you're also in that budgeting stage, and that might be for a large program a year out or two years out, and as fast as technology moves, you may be intentionally a little bit more lenient on what this product does today versus what's in the near-term roadmap for development. Because if your need is going to be much more satisfied by this product as it matures. And you're not putting that RFP out yet until you've got the, you've got the funding to a degree ambiguity on both sides can work to a positive. As long as you get to a point where you draw the line, when you're writing that RFP, you do a double click rule on the fact that this really does exist because I've seen a lot of RFPs that came out very immature from people walking around trade shows, and they did not discriminate between what's today, what's tomorrow, and what's never. And an RFP is coming out for something that just doesn't exist. And I remember having a conversation with an agency that had nothing to do with you. This is completely- (laughs) Thank God. (laughs) And And I called the guy up and I said, listen, I said, this, I know this industry. I know what you're asking. This does not exist. You have a wish list of five different products and technologies. It's like a best of, and you're you're rolling it all into one solution. It does not exist. Well, he says, well, then I'm told that it does. And I said, well, good luck to you. Two years later, right? I never responded to it. Two years later, they, another RFP comes out for the same thing, right? Yeah. So I, I called the guy up and I go, well, what happened? He says, you know what? You were honest. <laughs> He says, if all the respondents had been that honest, he wouldn't. He says, I wouldn't be putting this thing out again to bid. So some of the best projects on an, from an integrator perspective, some of the best projects you get are the ones you don't get because you know that it's that it's going to be quicksand. So <laughs> ju- just as much, you're right. You, that, that's you hit hit that point right on the head. However, I have seen because it happened to me where I have been misled by information that I have been following. So I I, I stay on top of a lot of good technology. One of the best technology. Well, I think you coined trust but verified before running the <laughs> so Maybe. So I read a, a particular one. I'm not telling people to read it or whatever, but I find it very interesting. It's called NASA Technology. Okay. It's a very interesting magazine. Anything they, they this is stuff that NASA creates to sell, which they've mm-hmm. done for their program. And one of the things I read about was, and I called somebody else who, who knows this technology very well, is it reference to an arsenide chip for, for a camera. And the problem that this particular needed was, was to be able to see through fog, okay? Arsenide chip does that. I called up the vendor, the, the manufacturer, excuse me, and I said to the manufacturer, do you have this? Absolutely, they had it, okay? And I looked them up, and, they, then, and in their website, they had the arsenide chip. I must have called them 100 times. I was kind of calling my integrator at the same time. I'm saying, this is what I need to accomplish. And the company couldn't come out with it. They, they, they had the chip. They didn't do it. But here I had a project and I had the money and I, was, and I even had the, the contract to be able to do it with. Yet the supplier has to also understand that once you give out information, you have to be able to make sure that it's going to hold because that person... I have some news for you. I went to my department head and I said, we have the solution. Here it is. Kind of makes me look stupid afterwards. Again, you are in, you are the educator. The agency cannot spend the time on your knowledge that the suppliers and the vendors have. They are the key educators. One of the great phrases one of my old board of directors coined was, you know, Jim, can you put ketchup on it? <laughs> if you can't put ketchup on it, it's right. just, it's vaporware. So you may not get an answer when you get that question in reference to budget, but if you do get one, you begin to think about when the project will become reality. 
I would make the assumption that no one has ever bought that's brought up that subject with an attendee. I mean, you guys, have you have you ever dared ask the question, do you have the budget for it? Okay, because <laughs> it's a scary question to ask. Yep. However, if the product or service or concept is something new, then it will be a long row before it goes into a procurement stage. Okay, so how should you best present this, their product, the, the product or service? You need to look at yourself as a teacher and how you would want to learn about your product or service. I can tell you that I have seen a lot of salespeople in the sales role, not at the education role. You need to use your introduction of your product or service wisely since you have a small window of time with that individual at a show or seminar. You can think of it as the elevator, elevator speech, but you got a little bit more time. Other item is how will you motivate the, indivi- motivate, the, excuse me, motivate the individual and get them vested into your product or service that meets their need or solves their business issue? If you do not have, to have a strong, simple motivator, remember, these people are going to go from meeting to meeting to meeting or table to table up front, then you will lose their interest right off the top. I can tell you what I do at a show. I spend about three hours at any show going to every desk. And if the guy doesn't catch me and understanding what it is, I say, and and I go into that a little bit deeper later on, then for all intents and purposes, I just move on to the next table. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, I do not take the chocolate. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) In most cases, the agency has no idea what your product or service does and how it can best benefit their agency. And that's what you got to look for. But most products or service presentations are focused on the product they are selling and not on the issue to be solved for the government entity. If you want to make the home run with the government agency, you need to, you need to go at it from their view so they can see how your product or service solves their issue. Does it increase their productivity, lower their headcount, bring in new revenue, increase security, help movement within the region? Those are the questions you should be asking And if it's yourself. all of the above, jump on it. Jump. <laughs> Absolutely. But if you want to be successful, you need to understand their vertical and what drives their needs, both present and future. And that doesn't mean that you may go into an agency, let's say a finance, you you go into city of finance for New York City, and you say, I want to sell some security product. And you say, well, what does finance have to do with me still going in there? So guess what? They have doors, right? So they have security issues. So you need to be open-minded, but also understand their needs. All right. Take a... Take another break here. You are listening to the Risk Advisor podcast hosted by myself, Jim Henry, and Sal Freire. We invite you to comment on our blog at theriskadvisor.com and subscribe and follow us on our social media like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you are interested in having one or both of us speak at an upcoming event or would like to consult with us, please go to our webpage at theriskadvisor.com to set that up. So. Let's wrap it up here on the on the logistics, and then when we get into the next podcast, we'll really zero in on the deep dive on so, the solutions. So having a meeting and asking them for the present future plans or hurdles by understanding their issues, you are stating that you are interested in helping them grow and be successful. You need to remember that their purpose is serving the citizens, the state, or the region, so it's imperative that you know their industry. Some of my best peers in the government that I have met with would ask a simple question such as, please explain to me what your service or product does to solve. The interesting thing is when I ask that or my peers ask that, the people at the other side of the table think, what the heck is this guy? He doesn't know what he wants or what he wants to do. And that's not what he's asking. He's asking to be educated. This may seem like a simple question for a no- uh, from a novice to you, but it allows you to develop a relationship with them and also pitch the service product towards their needs. So how do I know If I am speaking to the right person, be aware that the major percentage of those going to a show are not the decision makers. (laughs) However, they may be the ones writing the RFI, RFP, or RFQ. You've got the unit heads, the directors, once in a while an executive director. They're going to the show because they may be giving a presentation. They may be going there to, to also learn something, but they're not the writers of that RFP. They're bringing back some brochures. Or it's at a location that they want to go to, like Hawaii. Uh, yeah. You know, and I've seen, you know, and, and, and you may have some that are just out there crawling. You know, they, you know, they, you know, they get to do a trip. They, you know, they pull some information back. It's generic. They're really just looking to justify the fact that they that they made the trip and they're going to come back with some information, but it's throwing you know what against the wall. So <laughs> when we get to the last part, which is the solutions, we'll get back to the part of what the business card is used for. Okay, <laughs> and we'll get to there. So 
However, the one writing the RFI, RFQ, RFI or RFQ, they are the ones to showcase the product, the service, and give them the ideas of the product or service that you want them to do and what they need to sell. You need to be adept at teasing out their needs, determining if they are the key players. How do you find that out? That's key, okay? You need to find out and ask them those questions. So should I spend the money to showcase, present a topic, or just mingle and meet with, uh, meet with them during a break or lunch? If you have a new feature, then showcasing is excellent, okay, because this is new, okay? If you have some sort of a new security pro- product, you have some, some sort of a new camera or whatever, they don't know about it. Nobody knows about it, okay? That's the place to do it, but present it as a learning topic as well. I have seen many of my peers learning from a presentation and many times learning their choices of vendors due to what they learned from a presentation. So I went to one that they were touring, talking about MPEG-5, I think it was at that time, and the guy was really good. He was going through what the process, what was missing, how it, what it was doing, and what it wouldn't do. You know, all those, all those kind of things are, are interesting. So how can you tell if the contact you have been given was broadsided, which we talked about earlier? Many times upper management is present at a seminar. They are, they are there to meet vendors, upper management, as well as see product and learn. And of course, now I just learned something that they want to just be able to have a nice place to go to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> It's, I wasn't going to say that. It's important, it's important at that time to understand whether they are senior, serious about your service or product or pushing you off to a lower level of management. The next item you need to determine is the process of going into, going into the RFI, RFP, or RFQ. Determining which one of these it will, make, will make a major difference on how or whether you, you answer your RFI, RFP, or RFQ. Questions you need to ask. You want to ask, when is the RFP coming out? You know, many people say, uh, you, know, you know, when are you going to buy? That's not the question. Not when are you going to buy, when is the RFP coming out or RFQ? If the date is known, then ask to get access to it. If the RFP is not yet out, then ask if there is an ap- approximate date when the RFP is going out. If none of the above, then ask, the, ask if the scope has been written. Now you have to watch all facial expressions and body language because if no scope has been written, then you are looking for one to three years before a scope is done and another year may pass to go through all the internal logistics before it goes out to bid. What I mean by internal logistics is that has it gone through finance, you know, for the agency's finance group? Has it gone through law? Has it gone through procurement? Has it been approved? Has it been rewritten 20 times between that, between the, the project manager and the, the department? I, department head, I have actually seen People who are writing RFPs, uh, consultant firms, who after they've written the entire RFP, the department head would say to the project manager, that's not what I wanted and had to start from scratch. And by the way, the consulting firm didn't get a dime more. Right. Right. Wow. How do you get to the fox? At the seminar or show, that person will show his or her strong knowledge and will most probably be the project manager putting together the contract and scope. That's the person in whom you need to key on. That does not mean you're going to get the contract. That only means that you have the person who has the most interest, who you, want to, who you really want to invest your money and time in. What does the at ex- least you're, you'd be chasing at least a paved dirt road. Instead yes. Of the dirt, dirt road. Gravel on it. <laughs> <laughs> so what does the exchange of the business card mean? And we'll go through that, get into that a little bit more. Getting and giving a business card is part of the dance of keeping in touch, making sure that the person asks for it and gives you an idea that there is some interest in your service or product. And I'll go into where it works, what it's used for in the, next, in, in the last podcast. The cold call. So how do I reach the right person? There are many ways in, to contact the people at an agency. Besides showcasing your product at a show you can present or attend professional industry events or giving a class. Think of it as a lunch and learn. I want you to know those things work. Lunch and learns. Lunch and learns really do work. Your aim is to teach the industry, okay? You're, that's what your aim is. You're not just teaching, we'll get into that a left. You're not doing the sell. Don't go there, okay? Touch on it. Don't go there. It's, it's, it's a little touchy-feely out there. But you want to make the people feel that you are the one with the knowledge. You're the one who can give them the right approach and direction, and we'll get into that. How do I make the close to seal the deal? This one is very easy. However, we'll talk about it in podcast three. <laughs> <laughs> I have a very quick answer for that. What are the best? How do I go about contacting key people in the government agency and whom do I call? What are the best ways to get to know whom to call? As I said before, seminars and professional agencies many times are the best way to meet people. 
what level of the agency should I call at? In the last in the last podcast, I will be giving away a few good links that will give you all which you should know. Contacts you can use to contact New York City, state, and federal. As we all know, going to the highest level is the best way to go. But the question you need to ask yourself is how do you keep that person engaged? And going to a director, okay, and getting his time is great. And if you miss the opportunity or he doesn't understand it, or he comes in from a different perspective, you have lost the entry and you won't get anywhere late, later. Should I follow up with an email? Absolutely. But how to make sure that it doesn't find its way into junk and trash, we'll talk about. Because <laughs> I can guarantee you, I will tell you, I will give away, the, 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 from my perspective, the key way that it does not find its way into junk and trash. Okay, in the, in the last, pro, in the, in the, in the, in the further on to the podcast, is procurement a good choice to call? It all depends on your charisma, and whether that person is willing to give you the contact. So, how do you posture your first meeting? What is the best way to posturing that meeting? You want to be successful when having the meeting. The question you need to ask yourself first, as we talked about previously, is: Are you speaking to the correct person? In other words, does he or she have an interest? Are they the right people at all? Do you have the right level? Do you want it, do you want it to be a lunch and learn? And again, I will bring that out. That lunch and learn is worth it, okay? Because you get a plethora of people from all different perspectives. I have sat at a meeting that literally parts of the organization I didn't, didn't think would, would come or even different parts of the industry for, that wouldn't come showed up for that lunch and learn. How do you find out if there's a real need? By giving a class or seminar, you can tease it out of, out of them with, with the right questions. Also, that works the other way. They may ask questions that you would want to basically put into your product or into your service in the future, which you never thought of. When you hear a question at a seminar, make sure you write it down and have someone capture it. Review these questions. So just you going there, it's really worthwhile. If you, if you, if you can do it yourself, it's great. I just... It, 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 I, I've seen people who try to do that and they get disjointed because the question comes up and you you stop your presentation, you answer it, and you kind of miss the, the, the flow of the future part of the presentation that you're giving. How do you know if you have the right people at the meeting? The questions itself will tell you whether you have, the, whether you have a novice group or people who have strong interest in the topic, which will then play out to your product or service. I was going to say, I think that, that probably is a good place to wrap. You know, we'll 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 fill in the rest of this. You know, in the beginning of podcast three, and I don't think I've ever heard a better lead in to the next podcast by saying you're going to show the the key way to not have emails go into trash. <laughs> you know, that's, that is definitely the dangling participle out there. But uh, <laughs> all right, you've been listening to the Risk Advisor podcast hosted by myself, Jim Henry, and Sal Afreri. We ask you subscribe to the show and like us on our social media sites like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We m- remind you th- and ask if you are interested in having one or both of us speak at an upcoming event or would like to consult with us, please go to our webpage at theriskadvisor.com to set that up. Remember, you can hear the show on your favorite podcast platform, YouTube, and of course, stream it at theriskadvisor.com. Thank you again for listening, and we hope you will tune in again for the next podcast. <laughs>